point. So I, I just wanted to welcome you all to this session and um, let you know that this is being recorded. Um, so we are so fortunate to have uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Lim with us today, and she is the assistant pr professor in the Department of Breast Medical Oncology at MD Anderson Cancer Center. Um, she primarily sees patients with triple negative breast cancer, stage four metastatic breast cancer, and inflammatory breast cancer. Um, her passion is um, developing new therapies with a strategy to kill aggressive breast cancers effectively by conducting clinical trials and transformational research. Um, I am the Regional Outreach Manager of Young Survival Coalition for the West, and I'm also a 13-year survivor of inflammatory breast cancer. Um, so it's very personal to me to be able to be here with you and ask questions of Dr. Lim. So she's also offered kindly to um, have an informal session with us tomorrow morning before she flies out, just in case there are some personal questions that you would like to ask where it's not being in a recorded setting. Um, so we will connect with her afterwards and allow, um, she's will allow us to ask uh, personal questions. Um, so without further ado, here is our lovely. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And then I'm using the mic because I know that it's recorded session. So I was instructed when you ask me a question, I need to repeat so it can be also recorded. So I'm going to just be like, you know, try to be informal as, as much as possible. And yet, because it's being recorded, I will give a little bit of um, lecture form. But I want this to be really interactive. You can stop me anytime. Um, I don't mind that at all. Uh, but we'll just go through the processes and just to go over, a lot of you probably are very familiar with the disease, but we just wanted to touch base on the really basics first, and then we're going to go over some of the new initiative, and then we're going to try to wrap up with the question. So inflammatory breast cancer is something that right now there is a multiple forces being get together and trying to define what is really inflammatory breast cancer. So, so far, Believe it or not, inflammatory breast cancer is not like one of the very distinct um, disease, although it is very distinct in the clinical features and the outcome of the patient. So the current diagnosis of inflammatory breast cancer is actually really based on the clinical diagnosis. So we are taking counter of a few of the items. Number one, this is a something that, let's say I do have a patient who's coming from outside, uh, diagnosed by their physician as an inflammatory breast cancer. But when you talk to them, they're actually telling you that, by the way, doc, I felt a mass or a lump like two years ago. I didn't want to burden my family. I didn't want to share with anybody. And two years later, now the breast is really full and inflamed and really painful. That is usually not the primary inflammatory breast cancer we talk about. Many of my patients find some like rash or streak Initially, they thought, that, oh, maybe I kind of hit somewhere. Maybe I was, you know, put my sports bra too tight when I was playing tennis or spider bit me. And then within a few weeks, two months period of time, usually within three months, it, in, you know, evolves into the full breast or the at least one third of the breast swollen, thickened, having some orange peel-like changes. And then it usually causes pain, itching. And so it goes against with any of the kind of like uh, this, it's not really fake news, but you know, the advertisements say, oh, pain, no breast cancer, which is not true. So in this case, it's actually very typical symptoms. And I, I put up two pictures of my patient who gave me uh, allowance to use this picture. So the lady on the right is Caucasian, who we can clearly see that there is a red and inflamed breast. My patient who are African-American were the Hispanics who are darker skin. Sometimes color may not really look like red. It may actually look like more purple or the dark brown, but those are also same very similar changes based on the capillaries and the lymphodermatic system engorgement. One of the thing as a researcher who's studying a lot of inflammatory breast cancer, I think the secret is this uh, structure called tumor microemboli or the tumor emboli. So when you actually take the right spot when you're having these changes within your breast and then biopsy and take a look under the slide, you can actually see that the concurrent relation is very small like unit of the cells. So we call it tumor emboli because in you know, emboli basically means that small unit of cells spreading everywhere. And then this is really the scary guy um, to me because this tumor emboli is very different. It almost has a free pass to go everywhere. So it like just 
you know, so it's really funny that when it gets together, it's almost like a very close, tight family. If you're trying to attack them by radiation, chemotherapy, or conventional therapy, it doesn't really res you know, respond to be like, huh, if you're going to attack me, whatever. But then it almost has a free pass that as soon as you touch the lymphatic vessel or the blood vessel, it can just spread anywhere. So I have a lot of patients that at diagnosis, if they have a one side of the breast, if you're doing looking thorough enough, they could have a metastasis into the other side of the lymph node, neck lymph node, mediastinal lymph node, and even to the other organs. So that's something that we are trying to unravel biologically. So the, the researchers, there are some international group of experts who are really focusing on the IBC. And then you may be familiar with this, you may never heard of this before, but we do have something we called as a IBC Ward Consortium. And so this include uh, people at MD Anderson, there are people who are studying this disease in Duke, we have a people in Northwestern, Dana-Farber, and then internationally, there are a group who are strongly advocating and then researching in this area from Belgium and France. So in 2008 or so, it's like about you know, 10 or 11 years, so that's kind of tell you how late we, we've been in the game in terms of the research. And then you know, it's understandable because you know, before that, every like, sequencing was so expensive. The IBC was very hard to get because it's such a rare disease. But we tried to put our forces together. So if we actually collect our data together, can we really try to come up with a better diagnosis, better understanding of this disease? So, three independent investigators were able to come up with the gene signatures. So it's kind of like, you know, um, some identification. So like if you're looking at me, you're wondering, is she Korean, is she Japanese, is she Filipinos, or, you know, Vietnamese. And if you are familiar with us, you would kind of catch like, okay, so maybe she has this kind of eye, and so maybe she's more likely. So that's what the signature means. So we are trying to identify the set of genes. If you do have expression either up or down of the gene signatures, we can maybe differentiate the IBC from the non-IBC. So that's what the scientists have been trying to do over the years. Unfortunately, none of the signature were successfully identifying the IBC from others, which is, you know, uh, because of the many different reasons. However, we actually learned a lot about IBC through that process, including there's a craziness in the inflammation system within the IBC, which makes sense if you have such an inflamed breast. There is a lot of HER2 playing in the role in the IBC, even if you're not HER2 positive, something we learned. And then next, we moved on to next generation sequencing. So if any of you are scientists or have a scientist in your family, people always talk about the next generation sequencing. So we have a now tool that we can actually investigate the whole array of genes and try then to identify what are the mutations, alterations of the genes. In that, also, a little bit disappointingly, we didn't really identify that was very unique to the IBC. However, for example, again, like this HER2 amplification or the mutations were found in 13% of breast cancer cells within the IBC, which is very high compared to just regular breast cancer. So we are learning something. And then the next move on, you know, um, to better tools to identify this difference, we have a, okay, so if the patient with the IBC who's doing so well versus not doing well, can we actually learn from their tissue? So then we actually cross compare and their expression of the genes. And then through that, we actually, you know, finding very surprising things such as there's a difference in the cell cell contact that makes sense. That might be the secret how this tumor emboli navy seal is surviving from different attack. There might be the reason why they can really move on and progress through the lymphatic vessel much easier than other breast cancer. So they have a lot of the smartness that we are trying to investigate. And then the next is we are trying to see the whole exome sequencing. I'm actually performing the single cell sequencing, trying to see, identify individual cell, not only the cancer, but also the surrounding immune cell. So there is a lot of stu exciting studies are ongoing. And hopefully before it's too long that we would be able to find the biological, you know, true key reason why IBC behave in the way that they do. So I just briefly mentioned that there is a lot of, you know, strange changes in the inflammatory pathways within the IBC. Like for example, you guys are all familiar with the immunotherapy, right? So this is another one of the breast cancer that the active immunotherapy studies are ongoing. And that's because we actually find a lot of findings. This healthy T cell, which is supposed to come and flag them up so they can the immune cells can come and eat the cancer cells up, kind of messed up. They're very suppressed by bad cells. Bad cell meaning that you have inflammatory cells that you don't really need 
like let's say if you have a flu, you have a terrible inflammation, but <clears> that may not be something that you want. You know, you feel sick, you can get the admissions, you have very terrible feelings, and your just quality of life suck. All of those inflammation is upregulated, and then the healthy good T cells are very suppressed by those bad immune cells. So it's something that we are really trying to understand so we can actually develop a better therapeutics within that route. Another thing is there's a two major pathway that we're talking about in breast cancer called MEP kinase pathway. It's one of the very important, you know, the cell growth pathways. It, it's been, you know, regulated in melanoma, lung cancer, head and neck cancer. So we have so much of knowledge on those pathways, but it's really not well studied in breast cancer. But in IBC, as a, one of the aggressive form of breast cancer, we are learning that this MEP kinase is also very important and also interacts with the immune system. So something that we are also trying to investigate. The HER2, I kind of mentioned several times that something you really truly need to understand. Within the IBC, there are three subtypes that all exist. They're still ERPR positive. They're still HER2 positive. They're TMBC. In non-IBC world, about 60 to 80% of the cancers are ERPR positive, most common type, and I'm sure that you have the most experience and the knowledge. HER2 is only about 25%, and then there are patients who have both, called triple positive. 10 to 15 is about TMBC. Within the IBC world, it's a little bit one-third. You know, so one-third is ERPR positive, 35% or so are HER2 positive, and then one third is a triple negative. So there's a different distribution. So if we, uh, and then the other thing is, even if you're ERPR positive within the IBC, they behave very differently than just regular ERPR positive. So something that you may hear different stories and you wonder, okay, why me or my friend or my family is treated differently because of that reason. So just to kind of advertise a little bit about our own institution because you guys are in Houston, I mean, um, Texas anyway. We do have a very specific research and clinic programs called Morgan Welch. And so this is basically named after this beautiful lady. Uh, this is the lady called Morgan Welch, and she was diagnosed in her honeymoon with the inflammatory breast cancer, and she was only 22. She suffered through many lines of chemotherapy, and then she passed away at such a young age of 24. Um, and then as you know, that IBC, um, Although I do not have a really sol uh, solid proof at this point in 2019, I strongly believe that this IBC also take advantage of some of this young person's body. So even with the same disease that um, young person tend to have more suffering. So I think that's why it's so important for you know the YSC summit to cover this disease. Is that you know so I kind of really resonate with my patients for many reasons. But number one, it happens more on the younger patient. And then when that happens in the younger patient, it tends to be a little more aggressive. Number two, these young patients have their family to take care of. A lot of times that I have patients that who have their three-year-old at home, um, you know, they always ask me, like, would I see my son to graduate, you know? So something that's really, I, I, I'm single, I'm still, I don't have any, like, strong attachment. But for me, if I save that one person or can help that one person, I don't see that as a helping out one person, but helping out the whole family and society. So I think it's so important. So our vision and mission is basically trying to reduce the suffering of IBC through not only care for your quality of life, best clinical care, but also trying to really understand this bad disease so we can actually have a fundamental improvement. So sometimes, you know, something that we've been kind of, you know, focusing on for the last 11 years. The one of the difference in diagnosis of IBC includes, let's say, we are using some much of more kind of uh, modern technology. I mean, all of you are familiar with the MRI, all of you are familiar with the PET scan. Breast cancer, a lot of times, you know, you don't necessarily need those testing. You can still have a very good information by ultrasound or, you know, CT scan and bone scan. But in the IBC world, there are more and more data to come out that if you're using this little bit of different modality, you can actually get more information. And then it may may not apply to you. But for example, this is my lady that who's 76 year old, um, so a little bit on the older side for IBC. But you know, you can see that when she went to the mammogram after she felt like something was not right on her breast, her doctors basically told her after mammograms, "Oh, your breast is fine." you know, you, it is probably an in inflammation or infection. But that's because the whole breast was filled with cancer, and then unless you actually had the testing in the right modality, you couldn't even tell the cancer from non-cancer. So she actually suffered through multiple physicians delaying in the diagnosis, and thankfully she's actually doing well now. But this kind of tells you the importance sometimes that having the right expertise in the right time and trying to recommend the best care for each patient. 
So the way I see IBC, this is not just one person's job. I think the whole community, including each one of you, as an advocate for yourself and for your friends and family, is very important because, you know, the core of the IBC team are three experts who has seen a lot of IBC cases in surgery, who has understanding of how the IBC care could be different than radiation, and then people like me who are focusing on the IBC or the aggressive cancer in the systemic route. But more importantly, I think their timely referral of the patient to the right expertise are so important. I have so many patients who are telling me the story that they just got you know, told uh, by many different physicians that this is not a cancer, this is not a cancer, you're just getting the antibiotics, round, runs and rounds of antibiotics until they finally say, I don't know what's wrong with you, you go to MD Anderson. Um, so that's very important. So we are, as a part of this, such an effort, we are also trying to educate our gynecologists, dermatologists, and primary physicians who are actually seeing this disease even before the oncologist, and also the community oncologists. Some of them don't believe that IBS exists. If you ask them, they're like, Psh, IBS is a made-up diagnosis. What are you talking about? So I have to sometimes have use my own way to really convince them this is a very different disease. And so education is very important, and then there has to be a strong advocacy. I, I cannot even tell you how much I thank for like Amanda or Terry or Jeannie that express you know the, the express the term IBC. Now more and people at least have heard of the IBC. Ten years ago, like nobody was like what IBC? What what is that? You know. So I think those are very very important. And then of course, based on all this effort, we really need to create a different method of improving the care of these IBC patients. And so I don't want to gross you out, but I just wanted to know, share like why some of the expertise are so important, including, for example, the patient care who has a metastatic IBC. So a lot of times you will tell that, you know, or your friend who is going through stage four breast cancer, they will say, oh, you, once you're stage four, we don't do surgery, we don't do radiation. But it may not always true, especially in the IBC, because if you've missed the opportunity to have a really good local control, actually you can have a really miserable life. You may never be able to shower, you may never be able to go to the swimming that you like, and there's so much pain and you know things involved. It's something that it may not apply to every single patient in the stage four, but something that you really need to keep in mind, and that's why at least having that one second opinion or one addressing with the expertise could actually save a lot of people from this misery. So for example, in the stage four IBC patients, we always think about two things. Number one, because it's such a local disease, and then the, the tumor emboli or the kind of the navy seal of the cancer that I showed you earlier who are so aggressive can really spread through the chest wall. So it could really affect the, you know, the, your quality of life in a very like negative way. So when you're doing that, can we stop that process by removing all this tumor emboli that's sitting in your skin? That's number one question. But number two, act, actually it retrospective uh, review of MD Anderson series if the patients were, even for the stage 4 IBC, are able to go on the surgery and radiation, actually half of them stay with us, you know, despite all the myths out there saying that, oh, IBC, such a terrible disease. Like, you know, so my good friend Terry would tell you that she was told that she's going to live only like, what, seven months? And then she's still here, like 11 years survival. So it's, it's not always true that you really need to look into individual cases. And, you know, stage 4 is really not the same. Like, oh, doctors, you know, like even my really good friend who they're training with me and then now they're seeing the patients on the local oncology, they're brilliant people. But when you're labeled as a stage four, it's almost like, oh, stage four, I, we've done everything. Oh, as long as you live, like we don't really make any difference. But you have to really look at the individual of stage four cases, not in the only limit in the IBC, but more common in the IBC. Like look at my patients, the array of my patients. So... This lady, for example, she had the local, you know, the IBC with the swollen breast and, you know, all the local lymph nodes that they were diagnosed. But she also did have a lymph node on the other side and then really close to her lung and heart. So she was told that you're stage four, no surgery, no, you know, you're not going to be here for long. It may not so true. We may be able to induce a really good response and then give them a surgery and radiation in the right spot. Of course, you may never be able to come out from the treatment completely, but you may still have a very good quality of life with a low prolonged longevity with a good you know, uh, family and all this, uh, the goals of your personal care and all that could be achieved. Same thing apply to any of the other, the other patients that who have maybe one or two spots of the metastasis. So everything has to be individualized. But um, some of the stage four, 
it's very unfortunate that by the time that you come to see me, it may be already spread to the whole liver, and then there's no way that I can, you know, even, I, I don't even know, sometimes God can save this, you know, poor lady. She was like 34. I think she knew something was not right for a long time. She was just engaged, and she de decided to go on a cruise that she's been planning for three years, and so she finally got on a cruise, but she got so sick, couldn't even continue, came out of the cruise and said, get me to the hospital, came to us, was supposed to go back to Duke to get the treatment, but it was just too late. So we lost her in the ICU the very next day. So I'm, what I'm trying to say here is stage four is really not the same. So earlier, the better. If you have any doubt, it's sometimes not a, it's totally okay for you to tell your doctor and say, I'm going to just get the second opinion. And then there is a multiple ways that for you to get this opinion. And then if you don't really need like a, this true like experts or, you know, word noun people, that's great. You, you know, and then a lot of times we can work with the community oncologist. But I think number one, as a community, we have to really understand there has to be a personalized care even at the stage four or IBC. And number two, it's totally okay for you to get the second opinion, third opinion, you know? It's, it's your life. You have to be an advocate for yourself. So as of now, in 2019, we're trying to use a lot of um, method for us to improve our outcome of the patient. And then, you know, it sounds really stupid, but, you know, we are, we are stupid than cancers. So, so the cancers are so much more smarter than us. So sometimes the only way we can really learn and improve is really by investing in your own cancer. So, you know, sometimes my patient asks me, is like, oh, my God, Dr. Lim, I had such a painful biopsy yesterday. Do you really want me to get another biopsy in two weeks? And then I'll beg you and say, yes, please, because that sometimes might be the only way we can really understand. We have to learn from your baseline cancer. If we are actually introducing a new therapy, we need to understand what we can learn from after the treatment. Sometimes if you don't have a good response in surgery, we need to understand why that is. So this is something that, that's why doctors are always talking about these biopsies and the different you know, modification and so on and so forth. So now we're gonna go to the next round and just to show you a few of the exciting trials that's ongoing at MD Anderson. And then, you know, don't, Please do not feel that this is only MD Anderson. We are even trying to expand our protocols into the, the cancer network throughout the inter, you know, national, international. I've been really trying to open my study in the UK. It's been really challenging, but we are trying to move forward. So some of the trials that we're going to try to share today, for example, we have an adjuvant trial, meaning that you have all your neoadjuvant therapy, surgery and radiation, and then you, you are found to have a lot of residual disease then we can actually um, try to target those, the, um, the area of the immune modulation within the IBC. So for example, if you have a ERPR positive IBC, didn't really achieve the complete response, what can I do? Of course, you're gonna take the tamoxifen, you're gonna get the Zoladex, Arimidex, and all this wonderful drug, it is shown to benefit, but still, your risk could be much higher than some of the other you, you know, patients that you met uh, during the radiation. So the hypothesis is instead of giving them only endocrine therapy, if you add the immunotherapy agent that is being infused every three weeks through IV, can we actually make a difference? So I have a number of patients that who are undergoing in this treatment. Um, we don't have the good result to show you yet because it's such a rare disease. But you know, so far, I think that actually much less number of patients are recurring. Of course, the immunotherapy comes with the toxicity, so something that you have to be aware when you're actually getting into ty this type of treatment but something trying to define the role of immunotherapies within the IBC. So, you know, we are analyzing our first 10 patients with the tissues and blood, and so hopefully we'll have a new finding very soon. Inclusion criteria is usually, you know, trying to be very easy. Of course, so far that we wanted to exclude patients that who are, have to be take the steroid for a long time or, you know, have a previous immunotherapy and so on and so forth. We want only 37 patients to show that we, our study actually is right and then we were really trying to improve our outcome by 20%. So that's the adjuvant therapy. Um, metastatic IBC trial, that if you're you know, receiving other therapies and if you're really not responding or your therapy kind of stopped working, the next is uh, trying to move on to the next route and we're trying to design a very IBC specific studies. So I'm gonna just quickly move on to the next slide. So this is what we try to do. So at the beginning, let's say, you know, so we are told that, okay, your IBC kind of progressed on the previous therapy. Then we're gonna try to induce your some response by giving you the immunotherapy. The immunotherapy consists of two different agents. Number one is the pill that I showed you, the MEP kinase modulator that we like in the earlier slide. So this is the pill that we are using in the colorectal cancer and melanoma quite frequently. 
Um, and then in addition, we add the atezolizumab, which was just approved for stage four cancer patient, I think two days ago. Yeah, very exciting news for our stage four patients. So we give that drug every two weeks, and then that's really trying to recruit these healthy T cells within your environment. So they are like ready to launch if we are able to induce the response. Because in melanoma data, that about three to four weeks, your immune cells are trying to come into your like cancer area and trying to eat up the cancer cell. After four weeks, I mean, of course, we are like a, you know, vampires, tissue vampires, so we are asking for biopsy pre and post. And that's a really a burden for our patient, I, I know. But like I said, that's sometimes the only way that we can actually learn. And then after that, we add the chemotherapy for four cycles. And then after that, we drop the chemotherapy and then trying to continue the immunotherapy only. Something we were trying to do. The more exciting part is some of my patients, when you're getting treatment, this aggressive treatment, so you're accumulating the toxicity. You started to get the neuropathy. You started to get like you know this continued hair loss. Your hair may never come back. You have this very unexplained fatigue that with the accumulated chemotherapy. So the question that we had was, even though immunotherapy by itself was not strong enough to induce the response, but if we had a really good response with the chemotherapy and the other modality, can we then stop the chemo- chemotherapy and then actually put you on an immunotherapy with the very different side effects and then prolong it in the long time? So this is a single agent, pembrolizumab, the Kitruda they were using for, um, is also approved in breast cancer. And so like my patient, one of my patients who had a liver mat, had a beautiful response to the Halavan, and then she was on this study for 23 cycles without toxicity. Um, so it's something that we are trying to also learn. And then we are going to try to develop a newer therapies based on some of this knowledge that we learned from this trial. And of course, the most important thing is we need to do a really good job at the beginning. Even if even before you go for surgery, even before you go for you know, radiation therapy, we wanted to induce the response at the maximum level. So by the surgery, we don't want to see any live cancer cell. So that's uh, something that we are trying to attack this aggressive disease. So we have a old subtype IBC. We have a new adjuvant trial and trying to like uh, make a better outcome. We had this like really exciting data, for example, in the triple negative IBC, uh, the complete re- resolution of your cancer was only up to about 12% in the historical chemotherapy. When we use this new regimen of a carboplatin, taxol, and the penitumumab, of course, it's not an easy regimen. You get a lot of rash and all these uh, side effects, but we were able to induce that up to 47%. So it was very shocking to us. So we designed two trials coming out of it, one for triple negative IBC, one for triple negative by itself without the IBC. So I am the PI in the triple negative uh, non-IBC trials, but this is currently ongoing at MD Anderson. We're hoping to open it in the Cancer Center of America in Atlanta, you know, different sister institutions like such as Scripps, Cooper, New Jersey, you know, some of the other centers that we are working with in, within the cancer network. So hopefully it will benefit more patients. And something we might be becoming like standard of care for IBC patients and have the best response. The other trial that um, I'm trying to run is uh, like a triple H. So you remember that I told you that HER2 is so important within the IBC pathways. So can we actually have an additional drug to target the HER2, and can we actually make a difference in the response to the therapy? So this one has a two different cohort. If you're HER2 positive IBC, instead of pertuzumab, Herceptin, and uh, the Texane that you receive, we add the another pill called Niratinib, which is a pan-HER inhibitor. The only it's really kind of tricky um, clinical trial, although, you know, we developed it. It's because neurotinib actually causes a lot of diarrhea. So some of my patients told me, Dr. Nim, this was the best diet pill I ever had. <laughs> that was not my intention. But, you know, so we're hoping that we will actually have an improved outcome by using this additional strategy. We have a first few patients that went on, and then some of them actually having a really great response. So we'll see what actually comes out of it. More interestingly, if you're HER2 negative and ERP are positive, even those patients also do have an upregulation of the HER2 pathway or the mutations, as I showed you earlier. So we're also giving the, this pan-HER2 inhibitor pill in addition to chemo. And then some of my patients have been having a great response so far. So something that we are trying to learn. And then in addition to this, to all of these trials, they're all this, these are, uh, I kind of, summarize all the trials that is currently available for IBC specific. So 
I think we really need more of those. You know, IBC is kind of less recognized disease, but once you know that we have to quickly move on and make sure we offer you the best, you know, standard care. And then sometimes they, some, something like an IBC, the best standard care is not necessarily the simple chemotherapy, but maybe clinical trial because none of these trials are not necessarily randomized. We really try to give you something that's standard care and plus something else that we think that we're going to add the benefit. So something to watch for and then something to, and then if you have any questions about the trials and where these are trials are located, um, then I'll be more than happy to share that. So this is just, a, you know, the community work. This is not something that I do it myself. This is something that we really need to do it together. Like, for example, uh, you know, this is Terry, Amanda's good friend, and she's been strong advocates and survivor herself. Um, she's also trying to help us to kind of develop the psycho, you know, social help for our IBS patient. It's such a scary roller coaster every time that we get the new scan or, you know, new imaging that... They just don't know where they're going to stand. And then I kind of agonize with them. And sometimes, you know, we if the result is good, we celebrate together. If the result is bad, then it's really suffering, you know, for both me and, you know, um, this is my really good, you know, patient and advocate now that she initially had a really hard time to find the right physician. And later she had a beautiful response, but her physician at home didn't agree that she has a good response. And so we had to go back and forth and battle. So it's really like ongoing process of every single step could be tricky, but I think it could be so much easier if we have a much better resources nationally and internationally with this all this smart and beautiful patients like, you know, or advocate like you and also these smart people that who really adopt this idea of IBC and then how this personalized and then different care could be given. And these are uh, the 10th anniversary of the IBC, the summit that we had an international, you know, scholars who are studying in the IBC. Um, we all got together. I don't know if Jeannie, I don't know. Yeah, you were there, right? So I, I couldn't find you in the picture, but you know, yeah. <laughs> I see. Yeah. So, I mean, there's no way you can recognize one person. That's why I wear red to make sure that I spot myself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, so I do Twitter. Uh, some of my patients actually email me directly um, through Twitter when they have a more personalized question. Sometimes that legally I'm not able to answer, but sometimes, you know, I mean, we can have some, like, a almost like a euphemism-based conversation that what if, like, this happened, and many of those patients end up coming and see either me or my colleagues within the MD Anderson, something to... Uh, consider and then also we have wonderful colleagues in Duke and other centers that who are focusing on IBCs as well. And so that's the end of my talk. And you know I work with other great collaborators in the the breast group, and I'm hoping that we can make more contributions to everyone. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we're going to try to have a separate session. If you really do have a personal question, I'll be available tomorrow morning, you know, up until 10. Um, so, I mean, if you don't need me, that's fine too, but yeah. <laughs> okay, any questions? Okay, I think uh, your hand went um, first. My daughter has had um, her C positive uh, IBC for almost four years. And Mm. You know, they, they think that it's fatty infiltration, and it doesn't seem to have any kind of significant growth, but nobody's done a biopsy. What are your thoughts about that? Mm. So the question was that your daughter who's been a HER2 positive IBC, um, either probably she's on active monitoring at this point, and it had this like kind of nagging liver cyst versus lesion that nobody seems to biopsy, and then what could be the best approach in that aspect? So my answer is it really depends on the size of the lesion. So if the lesion is very small, sometimes that nobody can actually do the biopsy. But there is a other way that we can kind of characterize of that lesion. So for example, that um, so number one would be clinical uh, measurement. So if she had a beautiful response to the older therapy that she has received, and yet this lesion didn't buzz, a lot of times that that means it's not a cancer. So that's a really positive finding. Number two is um, a lot of this young females have this something called hepatic cyst. 
and sometimes it could be related to, it's not really cyst but fibroadenoma that is more sometimes you can happen with the, the oral contraceptive or tamoxifen so if she's on tamoxifen it could be you know one of the reason yeah she could have that or liver cyst but that can be also measured by either the liver uh, targeted like a three phasic ct or the mri could be better characterized in those lesions so if that has never been done it might be a good idea to do it once. If that looks great, then we can just monitor maybe with the CT like once every two years or so. And then after she, like 10 years or so, if nothing hap- you know, changes, then I tell no more scans, free of radiation. Yeah. Um, is there a standard of care once you're done with active treatment and you uh, have complete response for imaging? Like when do you, you know, like, is there, like, an imaging schedule for an IBC patient that's perhaps different? Yeah, that's an excellent question. So the question was, after you finish your supposed to be, like, a five years or ten years of the treatment, depends on what subtype that you have within the IBC, even after having the good response, uh, being an IBC and IBC is such a high-risk disease, is there any imaging modality to monitor you and make sure that cancer hasn't come back? Um, excellent question. And it doesn't only apply to IBC, but all high-risk patients. So something that we are actually working on, for example, there are two data that came out using the, your blood um, testing. So first of all, imaging modality every year is a, such a terrible way for you to monitor because, you know, imaging doesn't pick up every single thing. Um, for you to pick up anything in the imaging, you have to have a, at least 10 million cells or so to show up as a, even at that nodule, long nodule. So it's really not a good way to um, measure. As a cancer society that we are having so much of questions around this area, NCI just even like published a new like a grant system and say, can you identify a blood marker that is much better than imaging? So something that we are working on. So two data that I try to mention is number one, even for early stage, like stage two and three, uh, stage one and two cancer patient, about 5% of them at five years after completion of your treatment had still circulating tumor cells. This was Sperio, uh data was published in San Antonio. It shocked everybody. And then many of those patients recurred. So something that we know that is happening, um, if you want to test every single person under the sun who's having this possibly a risk, it's just not feasible. But we are trying to develop the protocol that is focusing on such high risk, including definitely IBC. And number two is there is also data that after surgery is complete and then you know, a few weeks by after the surgery, even after you have you know, what kind of response, if you do have a existing circulating tumor DNA or circulating tumor cell at that time, many of these patients also recur. So something that I think we really need to answer as a researcher, we're trying to put it together, is just... Um, it's such a like a project where things that they cost so much of money, they can, all of these testing are so expensive that we are struggling to find the fund, but we are, my goal is trying to get this done within the next year or two years. So something that I think it's going to come up, and then it may not be imaging, it may be more in the blood. So the question was, you know, as a high-risk IBC patients that you're on the part of the study of the disseminated cancer cells, which is slightly different than circulating tumor cell. And then after a third time of checking disseminated tumor cell, you actually were positive, And then now you're on drug therapy based on those. And so, and then your question is, can we do something? Do you need to look out for something different? Or do you have to address some of the other questions that you're not asking? Or... Mm-hmm. Um, so I'm just thinking 
as I go through this trial, if there's something maybe I need to be thinking about or asking the oncologist mm -hmm. about that might be different in, in my case and with others that have IBC. I see. So the, in addition, because you do have IBC where there's a tumor emboli exist and then different way of dissemination, is your disseminated cancer cells covering all cancer would still cover the IBC or would there be additional things that you need to look out for or ask for? That's a really excellent question. I think um, something I think we don't really know. So for example, there was a really exciting science paper, the Nature paper just came out. And then in that way, what they found was we always talk about circulating tumor cell, disseminated cancer cells. It was not so much of the how many cells were, and then, you know, the one thing you need to understand is even though we say that circulating tumor cells, or you feel like uh, there's the individual cells floating around, and sometimes that is true, but sometimes actually that there is a group of cells that we find in the uh, blood, and then we think that maybe if you find the cluster of cells together, it may be even slightly worse than the finding the one individual cells. And then the most recent Nature paper suggested if you're one of the immune cell called neutrophil, which is supposed to fight with your bacteria, it is kind of tagging the cluster of cells. They're kind of moving them around and then kind of give them a new niche, a new home. So that could be more dangerous. What we do not know as of 2019 is, is that specific to any subtype of breast cancer, such as an IBC, is something that we need to figure out. So as of now, I would say the answer is no. I think you're doing a wonderful job of advocating yourself. But number two is it may change in the future. So I think just keep up with your communities and then look out for new findings is something that I, I would say you, know, you should do. Mm -hmm. um, excellent question. So actually, the National Cancer Institute is recruiting patients. And as you know, that there was this big paper came out, and one of the ER positive stage four patients nearly got cured. Of course, so she's still on treatment. So, you know, so it's not like um, I discussed with my patients. It's something that we could use in the future as a eradicating your cancer. As of 2019, you'll never be able to free from cancer. But CAR-T is something that is definitely coming for breast cancer, starting as a very small group in the NCI. I think one of the challenges is that CAR-T also comes with a very high cost and then very high burden of um, side effects. So you may end up being like a, you know, Dr. Love mentioned about the transplant. So stem cell transplant, one thing that you may not know completely is that they suffer from lifelong suffering from the GVHDs and some of the inflammatory like, you know, side effects. I had my dear patient when I was a fellow and then he was a two-time AML survivor with the tra two transplant and then he survived. But he told me if I knew that I was going to suffer this much, I would have rather died like five years ago because like, he lost his job because of so much treatment. He had a constant skin GBHD to toxicity. So I think it's going to come and then it really needs to be better than what we have now. I think it's definitely in the future. At MD Anderson, we were trying to do that last year, and then we kind of last minute we closed. So something in the future. But we may even have a better option than less toxicity and less cost issue. Because current CAR-T, they're offering their two services, and then they're like $380,000 for one treatment or $480,000. So I don't think I can offer that, but, you know, <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yes? Um, so I think uh, two things maybe you can add in addition to funding and the research efforts. Uh, so you, the question was, I'm sorry, I forgot to. Uh, the question was, is there any other route or the method that it can improve the IBC prognosis and care of the patient in addition to funding situation? So funding situation is, I would say, it's actually improving, you know, thanks to like Jeannie, Terry, and Amanda, and all of you, there because there is more recognition. And even Sujan Jikoman put out the two funding mechanism last year, which is a big, by itself, we just, we were so happy that, oh my God, finally, Sujan Jikoman acknowledged it. But I think the two, still two major challenges include number one, the lack of true understanding even among the healthcare providers. So even doctors don't understand what the IBC is. And then I was very surprised when I started working with the community oncologists where even some of these smaller academic centers that they never heard of it, they never seen it, they don't really understand what the difference is. So that's something that we need to educate you know, our community much better, including our healthcare providers and the community. And then number two is really um, 
which is a more bigger problem within the health network. So I have patients, for example, who are kind of questioning whether do, they do have this IBC, and yet they don't really have a good route to reach out to the expert center and also stay within the expert center even they really need. I had a like 34-year-old lady they, from California. Her sister was doing the gold fund and all this raising, but her insurance was not approving anything out of network, and she had to pay so much money just to come to see us in once. You know, So she saw us once and never could come back. And then this is one lady that I think she could have been really benefited by seeing the experts. So those are the probably also very important issues. Yes. So is there a difference between regular TNBC and regular uh, the TNIBC? So right now as the way that we see is that triple negative breast cancer is a very heterogeneous basket so even if the same triple negative sound really scary there are patients who still have a good type of triple negative there are patients who survive and have no problem they have a really good kind of tmbc like you know 30 percent to 50 percent 50 percent of tmbc have a beautiful response to chemotherapy and they never have to worry about recurrence and so on and so forth as compared to triple negative ibc most of them are really in the aggressive form of triple negative IBC. So their survival is poor, their treatment uh, is very resistant. And when we actually, I have a really good friend of mine who's studying the triple negative breast cancer within the, she's, she's in University of Kansas. She's an African-American. So her focus is what is the difference for African-American? And one thing we learn is that actually the microenvironment, your tissue that where the immune cells live and different cells live within the breast in the African-American TMBC, is very similar to triple negative IBC overall. So something that we are learning, but I think the number one is the outcome, number two is a structural you know, microenvironment that we don't really full, have a full understanding. And then that's one of the reasons is because actually not um, of these patients are, have a meaning to kind of, or amenity to participate in the clinical trials and biopsies and so on and so forth. So that's what we need to improve as a community, I think. Did I answer your question? Yes. <laughs> For IBC patients, um, let's see. It's still only handful, so like you can count them, you know, up to like maybe ten trials compared to there's how many metastatic breast cancer trials out there, in like hundreds and hundreds. So um, and then. Yeah, so right now within the United States, because many of the, the challenge of this clinical trials is that it's something called IND. So meaning that if something happens to in the, in the clinical trial that is not safe for the patient or something, then I'll go to jail because I'm the PI who designed the trial. So if I have a trial that is open everywhere and then they don't really have the same regulatory capacity to monitor the patient, report the side effects, and manage how to learn them, then it's really challenging. So the IND office will not allow me to go. So that's why I failed to open my study in the UK. And then Peter Schmidt, who was the inpatient study, like a PI, and he was very excited. So can cure the IBC in the UK? We failed miserably, you know, because, you know, the Merck didn't want to pay for the cost and IND didn't want me to go to the jail. You know what I mean? It's all hypothesis, but, you know, so, but that's the reality. So there's a lot of challenges. So that's why I'm thinking that if you have a much more investigator who are strongly understanding IBC, who really have a good education, understanding, have a means to do it, then we can open in the multiple sites and they'll save a lot of patients. Now, geographically, like, for example, like California is such a desert for IBC trials or anything, there's some, you know, Boston, and there's a Chicago, uh, Houston, and I think that's pretty much it, and North Carolina, that's pretty much it, so, yeah, I guess that's it, yeah, <laughs> thank you, everyone. Thank you.